Well, what an awesome morning it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Y'all did a wonderful job. Y'all, some of y'all know why I said awesome right there. Because uh, you know who I'm referencing this morning. But I do appreciate your patience and diligence as we carried out uh, the business of the church this morning. And uh, just as a reminder, now that everyone has been voted in, if you did sign up for a committee or for a team or for uh, Sunday school teaching position that all starts uh, this coming Sunday. So new deacons, uh, that will all start this Sunday. Uh, as we take on those roles, we'll be praying for you. Uh, continue praying for God's will and God's wisdom for our church as we uh, approach this new year uh, for our church. So appreciate that. Appreciate your patience with that. And so uh, last week, as you know, if you haven't been here in a while, we've been working through past pastor sermons leading up to our 100-year anniversary. Uh, and so I started with Leo Lowry, who was the first full-time pastor of our church, who was pastor in the late 70s into the early 80s. And so last week, as we've been going through that, we came to a message once brought to us by Pastor Lee Merck. Pastor Lee Merck served this, served this church as one of the younger pastors uh, that y'all had and uh, that we've had. And so he served from the year 2000 to 2005. And uh, at first as, as interim pastor and then as full-time pastor uh, and from 2003 to 2005. And then the message we looked at last week was 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, which he preached on March 25th of 2001. And we were talking about do not despise the youth and what that means. And what that means was, what we looked at is that when we say do not despise the youth, the youth are not to be despised because of those young believers that provide that godly example. And that godly example will outweigh the hindrance of them being what culture considers a youth. And so him being a young pastor, myself being a young pastor, I could relate with that and understand, you know, youth being youthful is not always a hindrance if you're able to provide that godly example that the Holy Spirit provides. And so uh, what a blessing Pastor Lee was. And so this morning, uh, after his tenure as pastor, we became, uh, the next pastor was the beloved Reverend Bob Watts. And uh, he served as pastor of our church. Uh, he gave his first message, rather, to this church on June the 26th of 2005. And then he was soon voted in as interim pastor of our church in mid-August of 2005 and served in that capacity until June of 2006. That's his interim pastor. He then became, Brother Bob became full-time pastor of this church on June the 18th, 2006, and he faithfully served this church as pastor until he passed away while serving on November the 6th, 2009. Bob's wonderful wife, Sandra, still attends here, and uh, we're so, so thankful for what a faithful member she is. And uh, I knew when I came here a little over a year ago that seeing what care and what love this church provided to past preachers and their wives especially that you were a loving and a caring church to say the least that they're still connected and they're still tied in and so there's no doubt that you uh, love her and uh, there's no doubt that he loved this church i can't tell you of one person i've met that did not like or did not love uh, pastor bob and uh, i mean I, I can't tell you the times people have referenced things that Bob preached about. And I have to be honest, when I came here and people spoke of Bob, I thought he was pastor here 25 years. And, uh, of, of what an impact he made. And, and he was only a full-time pastor here for a little over three years. He was a part of this church almost five years. But, but the impact that he gave in those few short years is, is insurmountable. I mean, it, it really amazed me at what a connection he had with you. And I'm so thankful for it. And just going through, you know, as I do the bulletins, going through the sermons that he preached, you could see such a love that he had for this church just in his sermon titles. You know, when, when your pastor, when I get up and preach sermons, they are addressed to you. And I'm speaking of something that I believe the church either needs to understand or needs to go forward with or something that uh, we need to look uh, into the future about, what the Lord is calling us to do as a church, those types of things. And so the pastor of the church is always focusing on the congregation and its spiritual needs. Well, Pastor Bob, a lot of his sermons actually would include the name Heitzberg. Uh, just uh, one in particular, uh, on June the 10th of 2007, he preached a sermon called, What About Heitzberg's Future? And what would he say today in the future of Heitzberg and where we've come 
some 12 years later uh, when he preached that message. And so there were many others that included the name Heidsberg uh, in his messages on Sunday morning. And then uh, some of the highlights as I went through his time here, uh, one thing I really liked was in the bulletin he would have Bob's thoughts. And uh, he had a little uh, character there in the bulletin. And he would give wise or scriptural uh, insights as to what was going on with the world or the things that were going on around us and, and kind of his counsel about it or scripture's counsel about it and what to do about it. And so uh, had those in there week after week. I also found interesting that he uh, preached through from May to June of 2009. He preached through the letters to the churches in Revelation, which we just finished up not long ago as I preached through them uh, from January through June of this year off and on. And so uh, we preached on the same topics there. But as I went through his sermons, the one that really spoke to me the most and I think is most fitting for what we've been going through in the sermons, what we've been studying on Sunday night, was a message that he gave on October the 5th, uh, October the 25th, uh, 2009. And he entitled it, Remember, Repent, Return. A very Baptist sermon. Three points all start with the letter R. Remember, repent, and return. He gave that, as I said, on October the 25th, 2009. And it comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. And what's different about this morning than from the past sermons is that I asked uh, Mrs. Watts if she had any notes. And she had the entire notes uh, from Bob's sermon that he gave that morning. So I've included a lot of them this morning. Uh, as we go through. So let me throw this at you this morning. <laughs> and uh, So we're going to be in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the service that Bob and Sandra have given to this church. And Sandra continues to do, Father, as well as Bob and his leadership that he had. And Lord, as we look to your word this morning in the book of Acts, Father, we just pray that we understand you better, that we be able to understand the truths that you have revealed to us through your Apostle Luke that writes this book. And Father, we're just so thankful for the freedom that we have to come in your house this morning and worship you. It's all these things that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. And as I said, for those of you that come on Sunday night, some of this is going to be a refresher. And so I apologize ahead of time, but it's not something that is not uh, expected to be refreshed because it's uh, one of those things we expect to hear time and time again. But I uh, also let you know that I'm not trying to preach like Bob this morning by any way. Uh, I humbly confide that I am not the preacher that Bob was and I'm not going to preach like him. So what I've done is I've taken his notes and I'm using them in reference to the only way I know how to preach and that's under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so at times when uh, we go through, I'll say Bob said this uh, on that morning that he gave this sermon. So he began that morning with a quote, and I'll give it to you to, to begin this morning. It's from General William Booth. He's the founder of the Salvation Army. And he defined it when he said this, I consider that the chief dangers which will confront the 20th century will be this. Now listen to this. This is what will confront the chief dangers that will confront the 20th century. Religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without regeneration, morality without God, and heaven without hell. Does that not look like our world today? We are so quick to preach about heaven, but we don't want to preach about hell. We're so quick to say that we have religion, but we're so quick to leave out the Holy Spirit. We're so quick to say that we're a Christian, but we're so quick to fall from following Jesus Christ. And so that looks a lot like our world today. That looks a lot like our Christianity today, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, without hell. And so this morning, uh, as we come to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 26, we, I want to remind you of the, the words, remember, repent, and return. And in Acts chapter 3, what we're going to see, I'll give you a little backstory here. Uh, this is uh, Peter preaching a sermon. Peter and John, specifically Peter, is preaching here. And this is the second sermon that he's preaching to the Jews. And they are, uh, this sermon is being provided, provided through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, who has been sent on the day of Pentecost, that you'll read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 2. 
And he's delivering this message at the Jewish temple on what is called Solomon's Portico or Solomon's Porch there at the front of the temple. And what they've done is they have been able to heal a lame man. They've been able to heal a lame man that was there on the route to the beautiful gate to uh, the temple where they were going to pray. And we see him be healed in Acts chapter 3, verse 10, and how that was done. And it, actually, Acts chapter 3, verse 6, excuse me. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, as this was a lame beggar that was asking for silver and gold. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so Peter, being the vessel that was used by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit being manifested through him, miraculously healed this lame man and told him to rise up and walk. And what's important to remember is that it's in the name of Jesus Christ. It was not by Peter's own doings. It wasn't by John's own doings. It was because of the power of the name of Christ being manifested through these apostles. And so the man has been healed. In the Jew and this is during the time when the Jewish people have come to the temple to pray. We see that in chapter 3, verse 1 of Acts, where it says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, which was the ninth hour. So there was a lot of people here today, especially at this time, because it was during the normal prayer time when people would go to the temple, the ninth hour, and pray. And so the people around, they have seen this great miracle worked upon this lame man that Peter and John have been able to do and we see in verse 10 how the crowds that are at the temple respond to this miracle. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so seeing, Peter and John, seeing that the people that have witnessed this miracle of this lame beggar now being able to walk, not only walk, but enter into the temple with Peter and John, they are amazed. They stand in wonder at what has happened. And so Peter, recognizing that, sees that he needs to deliver a message as to what they have witnessed. And so as we come to verse 19 of Acts chapter 3, we're at the, uh, what I would say, the climax of his sermon, the focal point of Peter's message that he gave on that evening as they came to pray. And starting in verse 19, Peter preaches and he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise you up a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquity. So in this verse, as we begin in verse 17, he calls for the very same thing he called in his first sermon that he gave to the Jewish people. And we have to go back to Acts chapter 2 to see that first sermon. And he delivers this message in Acts chapter 2 as his first sermon when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and all the apostles, all the 120 that were gathered in the upper room, received the gift of tongues. And so as he preaches to those that experience this miraculous event of people speaking in different languages, Peter says to them in Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So his second sermon, same focus. Verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Only through true repentance are sins able to be blotted out, as it says there. Only by the blood of Christ are the sins no longer able to be seen by the Lord our God. And so he calls... For repentance so that times of refreshing and what is times of refreshing times of refreshing is peace 
with God that only true salvation that comes from true repentance can provide. So in verse 20, we come to the first point that Bob had that morning. And the first point is remember. What do we have to remember? Well, in verse 20, what Peter is telling them is to remember that same Jesus Christ that was preached to you before. Verse 20, Acts chapter 3. And that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. Remember the Jesus Christ in which was preached to you. And they've got three different ways that they ought to remember this Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ that Peter is preaching about on this evening that he's preaching uh, on Solomon's portico. And so the first way that they would remember is that since he was the true Messiah, since Jesus Christ was the true Messiah, these Jewish people were very literate in understanding what the Old Testament, the Holy Prophets, had said about the coming, about the sending, about the sacrifice of the true Messiah. And so they should have remembered what was said about the coming of the Messiah. That's the first thing they should remember. The second thing is that Peter had just preached to them uh, a couple days before about this same Jesus. And we see that in uh, chapter 2, verse 14, where he says, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. And those words are that Jesus, the one in whom you had crucified, is the one that was the true Messiah. And he goes on and says, Repent and be baptized. And then the third way, what I think is the most uh, phenomenal way that they should remember Jesus, is that the people that Peter is preaching to would have actually witnessed Jesus Christ walking on earth and his ministry. And the way we know that is because the man that they have healed is 40 years old. We find that later in Acts chapter 4. But what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus would have walked past this man day in and day out as Jesus went to the temple to minister, but Jesus never saw fit by God's divine leading to heal this man. And so not only did these uh, Jewish people witness this lame man, this lame beggar that sat at the temple asking for alms, but also they witnessed Jesus himself walking amongst them, ministering to the people and providing these miracles that Peter and John were now being provided through the Holy Spirit. And so that's the three ways they could have remembered Jesus, either through the preaching of the Old Testament prophets about the Messiah, through the preaching of Peter in his first sermon, or through the actual witness of seeing the physical man being Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so uh, when we come back here to verse 20 and uh, 21, we see that heaven must receive him until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And so at the appointed time, Jesus, being the Messiah, will be sent to reign from Jerusalem by the Lord. But for now, Jesus has been received back into heaven until the time has come to restore all things. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, we see what the Holy Prophet said about the Messiah in regards to the time of restoration or restoring all things on this great world of ours. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. What would this restoration look like that's coming from the Messiah? It says, They shall no longer hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. We know the holy mountain to be uh, Jerusalem. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Now the root of Jesse is uh, understanding that that is the Messiah that has come from the lineage of Jesse, the lineage of David. And so that is the root of Jesse who is, we understand to be Jesus. Who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. That is the restoring of all things that Peter is referring to back in Acts chapter 3 here as we go through this message. So once the Jews remember, once the Jews remember this Jesus that has been preached, this same Jesus that they have witnessed been crucified, and now they are witnessing has been resurrected from the dead, once they remember that, the preaching of Jesus, they are then called to our second point this morning, repent. They are called to repent of their ways. And we see repent there in verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So this is Bob's quotes this morning. 
What is repentance? What is repentance? A scriptural view of sin and a scriptural view of the devil. That is what repentance is. When you understand sin as the Bible explains sin, and when you understand the devil as the Bible tells us who Satan is. And so when we understand that, we understand the need for repentance. Bob quoted one of the great preachers of our time. I had to look him up. I didn't know him that well. But you may, uh, Pastor R.G. Lee. R.G. Lee said this about a scriptural view of the devil. He said, I believe in a personal devil because I have done personal business with him. I believe in a personal devil because I've done personal business with him. Until you experience the evil of the devil, you will never experience the refreshing, the restoration, <coughs> the need for repentance that the love of Christ provides. <coughs> and Bob said that morning as well, many seem not to recognize anything as sin. That was in 2000. And now, today, the things that we do not recognize as sin any longer has now become accepted, has now become ways of the world. He also said that morning that some will mock at sin, but a repenting sinner views sin as evil and deserves the wrath of God, the divine wrath of God. The true repentance comes to that mindset. They realize that they deserve to be on that cross. They just realize that they are ones that deserve to enter into the damnation of hell. They understand that sin is what causes death. The wages of sin is death. They understand that. The repentant sinner understands that. So they see the need to take care of that sin before the door is shut and it's too late. Billy Graham frequently, frequently made mention that the word repent is synonymous with the word change. You have to make a change in your life when you are repenting of your sin. You are no longer to fall back into that sin, but rather to come into the ways of righteousness that is provided by the Lord. That is true repentance. Let's explain a few other things here in this sermon of Peter's. In Acts 3, verse 22 and 23, he says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. This is quoted, Peter is quoting this from Deuteronomy chapter 18, specifically verses 15 and 19. And what he's saying is that the prophet Moses had foretold the coming of the Messiah. And since he had foretold the coming of the Messiah, they also understood that there was to be a rejection of the Messiah. And that's what he's talking about here in Deuteronomy 15, in chapter 18, 15, and 19. And so in verse 23, as he gives this verse, as Peter gives this verse to his Jewish audience, and we know Peter ministered to the Jews. Peter is a Jewish Christian at this time. And so as he ministers to them, he, and he says, it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet, the Messiah, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Well, the people that Jesus was sent to was the Jews. They were, he was sent to save those that Moses was preaching about here, that Moses was foretelling in his prophecy. And so what did they do with him? Well, they're standing in the shoes because they were the ones that had him killed. They were the ones that delivered him to be crucified. Pilate didn't want to have Jesus crucified. He wanted to let him go. He said, I see no wrong in this man. They said, crucify him. Crucify him. And so they delivered him up. And so they were standing in the shoes of those that would be destroyed amongst the people because they did not listen to what the prophet, the Messiah, Jesus, had said. In verse 24, it says, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. Moses wasn't the only one that talked about the coming of the Messiah. From Samuel onward into Jeremiah, Ezekiel, even Malachi, they talked about the coming of the Messiah, who was Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God. And then verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets. You are the people in which you are descendants of these holy prophets. 
You are the sons of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that's the Abrahamic covenant. That's quoted from Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. And then also in chapter 26, verse 4, we know that it came through the seed of Isaac. And so God kept that covenant with Abraham that a remnant of Israel, the Jewish people, would be saved, would be delivered. And so they reminds them of that. And you are sons of Abraham. You are sons of Isaac. You are part of this remnant. But you still have got to repent. You still have got to turn from your ways in order that those times of refreshing, those times of restoration may come. And then verse 26. Verse 26 is the relational moment. You know, when a pastor gives a sermon, the last usually five, six, seven minutes is him trying to bring it back to us. What is going on with us in your current situation? What's going on in your personal life, in your relationship with God? Well, that's what Peter does as the great preacher that he is here in verse 26. As he closes his sermon, he says, To you first, God, having raised up His servant Jesus, He has been resurrected. Jesus was brought from the grave by God Himself. He sent Him God sent Jesus to bless you. And that blessing is provided in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So here we have our third point this morning, return. What Peter calls for is to return to the living Christ. Return to the living Christ. That Jesus that you killed, that was sent for you by God, that God still raised up from the dead, He was sent for you to bless you so that you could turn away from your iniquities. No other possibility could be made for you to turn away from sin other than the sacrifice that Christ gave. Because He gave that, He gave us the opportunity to no longer live under sin, no longer be chained by sin, but to live in righteousness. Now, I want to do the same thing Peter did and bring it home to Heightsburg this morning. Many of you may not have been to church in a long time. Many of you have not been to church in a very long time. And some of you may have forgotten the joy of salvation that you experienced. You may have forgotten what the joy of salvation felt like when you truly had peace with God. So I encourage you with the first point that we had. Remember. Remember the Christ that has been preached to you. Remember the Christ, Jesus Christ, all that He is all that He has done, and all that He can do, and all that He will do for you. Now the second point that some of you may fall under. Some of you believe in Jesus Christ. Some of you believe that there was a man named Jesus Christ that walked amongst this earth, that was sent by God, that healed people, that died on the cross and rose again on the third day. You believe that. And salvation is said that if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But you have to understand the context of Scripture. Just because you believe in Jesus, salvation does not come until you do your part and repent of your sin to Christ. Amen. Until you come to repentance, you will never experience the joy of salvation. You have got to repent of your sinful ways to Jesus Christ. The one that was sent. Jesus says in Luke chapter 13 verse 3, unless you repent you all likewise will perish. Repentance is required. And then the last point for this morning, for the rest of you. Some of you remembered Jesus Christ. Some of you repented of your sin. But yet, the ways of the world came back into your life. You veered into the broad way of death, as Bob called it on that Sunday morning. You've entered into that multitudes that are hell-bound. What do we do? We return to the living Christ. That opportunity, as long as you're still alive, is there to return to the living Christ, to fall under His leadership, to be entering into that times of refreshing that can only come from the presence of the Lord that chapter 3, verse 19 of Acts told us. So remember that because of your repentance, not only are you going to return to the living Christ, but the living Christ is going to return for you. Amen. 
Jesus Christ is going to return to this world to all those that have believed, all those that have accepted Him, all those that have repented their sins unto Him. He is going to return for you as you returned to Him from your sinful ways. So do you truly want to experience peace with God? Do you truly want to have the joy of salvation? How is that done? Remember repentance and return. This comes from Bob. A person that follows those steps has a desire for the obedience to truth. Bob also said that those that re remember, repent, and return to Christ realize God's Word and God's law are now paramount in your life. He also said that the Lord, that they will ask, Lord, what shall I do? It is no longer, what am I going to do? But Lord, what are you going to do through me? as I walk with you. We plead, those that remember and repent to Jesus Christ, Lord, how must I serve Thee? How can I serve Thee as a follower of You? You're no longer walking in the broad way of death. You're no longer walking with the multitudes of the hellbound. You see a desire to attend the services that the Lord's house provides. You take pleasure in the holy acts of faith in the same way that these Jewish, this Jewish crowd gathered and took uh, great pleasure in seeing this holy act of faith of this lame beggar being healed. The crippled being healed was that holy act of faith. And I want to close by this, this morning, before I read the last passage of Scripture. Bob gave this plea, and the way he had it written in his notes, it was one of the first things he said, but I want it to be one of the last things that I say to you this morning. This is a direct quote from Bob himself. He said that morning on October the 25th, 2009, that his desire was for everyone within the earshot of my voice that they would hope or know that their salvation is secure. You should know, Bob says, that Jesus has placed a padlock on your future with Christ, never to be separated from His grace, to live in eternity with Jesus and with the multitude of saints around God's throne. That is the guarantee of your salvation today. Once you have remembered Christ, once you've, once you've repented of your sins, once you have returned to Christ, you are guaranteed salvation forevermore until He returns for you. I'm going to close this morning by reading Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I believe this verse describes what those three R's mean for us this morning. I want to close with God's Word. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Lord, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning.